get him stopping to visit uh, when he comes yeah. to this area. Uh, I'm glad to know he's still living for Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Also good to have Jesse Mantle here. He comes on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> <laughs> He said he came this morning because his daddy told him he was going to sing Presley's version of Amazing Grace. He did. He did. Amen. You didn't care what you say. You did. And Gordon, I want to know what that red uh, bandana hanging on your belt is. You think you're throwing husky or something? What's the deal with that? That's Keith was scratching the holy guitar. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> Amen. Happy Hanukkah. I forgot the right day there. We'll have the Easter egg hunt out there in the field after the yes. service. Okay. I don't know if Mr. Trump is saved or not. James Dobson says he is. Uh, he said he got no. First Peter chapter one. If I come in with a black eye tonight, y'all know why. <laughs> children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but uh, was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, uh, that, pray, uh, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, uh, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the glory of grass, as the flower of grass. Uh, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel was preached unto you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this wonderful book. And Lord, we realize uh, today is not really on the calendar when Jesus rose from the dead, but the world recognizes that, the Christian world. And we do uh, thank you so much that you, uh, you raised your son from the dead because we'd still be lost going to hell if you hadn't done that. He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Thank you. We're justified in the blood of the Lord Jesus mentioned here in this passage we're reading. And Lord, I just uh, pray you'd bless the rest of this hour. Help us to glean some things from the Word of God that will help us as the children of God. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now he says, wherefore, in verse 13, and that links what uh, we just read with the doctrine that precedes that verse. Uh, the doctrine of salvation, for example, drop back to verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it, the Spirit of Christ, 
uh, testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, first coming, and the glories that should follow, second coming, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, because of that, because of your salvation, gird up the loins of your mind, and so on, as he says down through the passage. So wherefore, or on the ground of our salvation, Peter gives us some instruction in these verses that we read about the Christian life. And that's what we're going to see, what he, the instructions, it's a fourfold instruction that he gave here. And we're going to see that. First of all, he talks about the mind of the Christian. Verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you uh, at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the form of us, the way you used to live, in your ignorance. So soberness of mind is commanded here because of the coming revelation. That's what he said in the end of verse 13, brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when he says gird up, that is a command that is not optional, that is not if you want to. We're supposed to do that. That. It's uh, it's a uh, it's not a request at all. It is a command, and it's a command from God directly to us. Gird up the loins of your mind, and then He tells you how to do that. What that entails, He says. He says, be sober. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Uh, that uh, means to be serious. It means to be uh, uh, solemn about the things of God. It means to be realistic. Hey, this Christian life is not a joke, and the fact that Jesus paid for our sins is not a joke. Amen. It's serious with God. It's deadly serious with God. It puts people in hell for rejecting it. Amen. We're to be sober about the things of God. Amen. There's a time to laugh. There's a time not to laugh. We're to be realistic, level-headed about it. First Thessalonians 5, 6, let us watch and be sober. Be careful. Know what, know what we're doing. Know what we're believing and so forth. Now, why does he tell us to be sober-minded here? Because uh, ver, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11 says, because the grace that is to be brought unto you at the verse, uh, end of verse 13 there, the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Particular grace. Chapter 1, verse 11, he says, So an entrance shall be ministered unto you into the everlasting kingdom, and so on. Uh, that's the grace of God brought unto us when Jesus Christ is revealed, second coming of the Lord. So we're to be sober in view of the fact Jesus is coming back. Amen. And you want to be ready when he shows up. Shall the Son of Man find faith in the earth when he comes? Luke 18, 8. Not much. Hopefully you'll find it me, you find it you, you'll find it this church and some other churches and so on, but not very much at all. So he's talking about the coming of the Lord. We're to be sober because of that. First Peter 4, verse 7, he says, The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Uh, we want to be found occupying when, the, when Jesus comes back. Uh, that's, that's what he says. We're to occupy until he comes. We want to be faithful, found faithful when he comes back. You don't want Jesus uh, to hear the trumpet come up hither and caught you in the middle of something you ought to be doing. Now, he doesn't mean you can't be in the middle of enjoying yourself about something as long as it's not something unholy. Not something sinful. He said in 1 John 2, 28, And now little children abide in him that we and not if when he shall appear, uh, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You don't want to be ashamed when Jesus shows up. If you're ashamed when he shows up, guess what? You don't have many rewards at the judgment seat, and you're going to be embarrassed to death in front of the whole church of Jesus Christ when he calls you forward to account for your life. So we've got to be sober about our Christianity. We've got to be serious about it. It's not a game we are playing. Uh, churches today, man, it's all fun and games, everything, everything. Uh, you know, they build, uh, you, see, you see a bill that says family worship, family worship center or something. Go in there, it's a gymnasium it's for playing basketball and stuff. And there's not, nothing wrong with that, but I don't think church is a place to be doing that. We don't have aerobics here on Saturday night in the house of God. Amen. Amen. It's Amen. A, Christianity is a serious thing to God. And it should be to us. He's not playing games. We shouldn't be either. Think about what God paid for the church in the first place. And you think he's going to be frivolous about that? Not at all. He's serious about it. This is God's business. And we need to concern ourselves with it. Uh, and be uh, serious about it ourselves. 
We're supposed to be attending to God's business while he's not here. Occupied like kind of was, taking care of his business, taking care of the Lord's business. First Thessalonians 1 verses 9 and 10 says we're to turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. Serve the living God while you're waiting for his son to come back. And uh, I'll tell you how serious it is about that. The devil, if he gets the upper hand in your life, you won't be serious about Christianity at all. You'll be frivolous about it. You'll be coming in some of the services. You'll, you'll quit reading your Bible, stuff like that. Uh, he'll have an advantage over you. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, why? Because your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't want you to be serious about your Christianity. He wants you just to, it's a, a sideline to you, not something, not the major part of your life. Remember what he did to Job? Job 1 and 2, I mean, he put him through the ringer. And Job thought God was doing that, but the devil was doing that unto Job. And twice we're told, in all this, Job sinned not with his lips. He didn't get mad at God, he didn't curse God like his wife told him to do. None of that, he stayed true to God. And the devil will try to do that to, to us, put us through the ring and so forth. And God will let him do that sometimes. Um, James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. To test our faith, to see if we're going to stay with God, no matter what's going on in our life. This is a serious business with the Lord. Amen. We're to think soberly. He said in Romans 12, verse 3. We're to live soberly. Titus 2, verse 12. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. God wants us to be serious about our Christianity. Amen about serving Him, about our testimony. You watch your testimony, you guard your testimony out there in the world. But be careful about that. You, you say something you should say. You use a foul word or something. or You get angry about something, I'll guarantee you, somebody will be around and hear you say that and see that and all that stuff. And you're going to be messed your testimony up. First Thessalonians 5, 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. He says in Romans 14, let not your good then be evil spoken of. Amen. You need to be serious about this stuff. Romans 12, 16, he says, Mind not high things, and be not wise in thine own conceits, full of yourself. Uh, he says in Romans 12, verse 3, We're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. You know what we are without the Lord? We're nothing. We, the Sunday school hour this morning was about uh, what Ephesians 4 was saying about the, the Gentiles, about the lost world, that absolutely vanity, nothing. That's what we are without Jesus. Amen. We're not even worth blowing our brains out without Jesus. Amen. But with Him, we're children of God. We're royalty. Uh, every time I uh, you go to shake hands with somebody, um, and they're sitting down, they stand up, I say the same thing every time. Every time. Uh, I, I know, when they shake my hand, I stand up. They say, you don't have to stand up. I said, oh yeah, I always stand up for royalty. Hey, Amen, you're a child of the King. This stuff is serious with God. Not a joke with him. Proverbs 12, 26 verse 12 says, There's more hope of a fool uh, than of a man wise in his own conceits. More hope of an absolute fool than a person that's full of ego, full of himself. A sober-mindedness, Colossians 3, 12, is humbleness of mind. It's the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. It's a mind which hath wisdom. Revelation 79. It's a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. It's a clean mind. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. No wonder he says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, verse uh, 11, I think. So because the Lord is coming, <clears throat> we're supposed to be sober-minded. Does anybody believe he's going to come back in your lifetime? I do. Anybody? Anybody believe that? He may or may not, but I'm looking for him. So was Paul. Paul was looking for him. Every generation is, is uh, admonished to look for Jesus to come back. And one of these generations, he's going to hit it right on, right on the head. And there, he's, there he's coming. Amen. So we're supposed to be sober-minded because he's coming back. Now, next, Peter talks about the morality of the Christian. Look at verse uh, 15. The morality of the Christian. 
He says in verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, everything about your life. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Uh, for if you call on the Father, who is who without respect to persons, judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in Fear. Talking about morality of the Christian. Holiness is commanded here because of our relationship to God. If you call on the Father. If God is really your Father, then act like it. Live like it. Talk like it. In other words, be ye holy, as he says here. And that's also a command. That's not optional with a Christian. That's a command. Uh, say, well, uh, I, I can't be holy. Well, don't you think God knows that? He knows what we are. He knows what we're made of and so forth. Then why does he commend it? Why does he say, be ye holy? Because you, you're holy in the sight of God when you yield yourself to the Spirit of God and let God live his life through you. He knows how and holy we are. He knows we can't do anything without him. So what is it? Philippians 2 verse 13. It is God which worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. So we just yield to him. He fulfills that command through the yield of believer. And you don't satisfy the flesh. You satisfy the spirit of God. And uh, you get the credit for what God's doing. Well, isn't that a deal? Isn't that a deal? He does it all. You get the credit for it. He even rewards you at the judgment seat of Christ uh, simply because you got out of the way and let him do what he wanted to in your life. Amen. Romans 8 verse 4. He says the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Follow what the Spirit wants done. The, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It's just yielding to Him. And He says there's no condemnation when you do that. Under no condemnation. Well, we're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, but we're walking in the Spirit, doing what God wants us to do. So the Holy Spirit, working in the yielded believer, fulfills the righteousness that God requires uh, of His own law. And consequently, Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Two times in those first four verses of Romans uh, chapter 8. So God cannot condemn us because the holiness he demands is being met even though he is the one meeting that demand. What a wonderful God we have. Amen. It's just like the, the wages of sin. He paid for that. So we wouldn't have to. Isaiah says, Isaiah 52 verse 11, he says, Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Your body, you know it. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you're saved, it's the vessel of the Lord. And you bear that vessel everywhere you go. If you go to a nightclub, guess what? You're just taking Jesus in there. If you're looking at porn, guess what? You're just letting Jesus see that stuff through your eyes. If you listen, listen to filthy stuff, you let not God, you, you have the Lord there having to listen to that stuff. And he tells you that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he said, talk, talks about you uh, making Christ uh, joined to an harlot and that kind of stuff. Wicked stuff, wicked stuff. He goes everywhere we go. You bear the body of Christ. You bear the vessel of the Lord. And so we're supposed to be holy. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. St. Corinthians said, one perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness. How? By cleansing yourself from everything uh, filthy of the flesh, the body, and the spirit, your mind, get it all clean before the Lord. We're to purge ourselves. He says in St. Timothy 2, 21 22, we're to purge ourselves from vessels of dishonor and be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, he says in that passage, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace uh, within the call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Hebrews 12, verses 14 and 15 says we're to follow holiness without which no man can see God. You won't see God working in your life if you're living an unholy life. It's just not going to happen. Follow holiness without which no man shall see of the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And so the Lord demands holiness in our life. Uh, and then the third thing Peter mentions is the motive of the Christian. Look at verse 17 again. The motive of the Christian, what it's all about. If you call on the Father, who without respect to persons judges according to him as work, past the time of your sojourning here, your temporary life here, 
in fear, uh, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver go from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish, <coughs> who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, uh, but it was manifested in these last times for you who you who by him do believe in God and so on. So he's, uh, our motive here is fear. Fear the Lord. That's commanded also. And because of our redemption, we're to fear the Lord. Matthew 28, uh, 10, 28 says, Fear not them which kill the body, but not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We're supposed to fear the Lord. Uh, he says our faith in verse 21 here in the chapter, our faith and hope is to be in God, verse 21. And because of what it costs God to redeem us, verse 19, we're to pass the time of our sojourning here in fear, as he said in verse 17. Well, doesn't the Bible say God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind? It does say that, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. But you've got to have that in context. The very next, next verse, verse 8 there, says uh, the fear is uh, uh, being afraid to testify for Jesus. Being, able to, uh, being afraid to have a testimony for him and tell people about the Lord. So it's not talking about the same kind of fear at all. We're not supposed to fear men. Proverbs 29, verse 25 tells you that. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso put this trust in the Lord shall be saved. So well, we're not supposed to be afraid to go out and witness for Jesus. Sometimes we are. Is that not true? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are. God wants us to witness to somebody. We just we, we don't want to do that right then. Or maybe the circumstances or who's there or whatever the case might be. We're not supposed to fear men, but we are supposed to fear God. God is our Father. Is that correct? Amen. And you're, you have an earthly father. And you're supposed to fear your father. You're supposed to love your father. So you're supposed to fear him. And you will love him if he exercises uh, chastening uh, the way he's supposed to, you know, in, a, in love, framework of love. And you're supposed to be afraid of him because uh, he'll keep you from getting in trouble. That's what. You don't want to get spanking, whatever the case might be. Well, that's why God uses that as a, as a typology. He's the father. He chastens his children. The whole chapter of Hebrews 12 is about that. He chastens his children. Every son that he loveth, he scourgeth and so on uh, like that. And so we should fear God. What is it? Exodus 20 where he gives the law. Uh, Take a memory in verse 20. He says he, he gave us those things. Uh, he says that my fear might be before your faces that ye sin not. God wants us to fear him so we won't get, get in sin. Realizing if we do, he's going to take us to the woodshed. Amen. He tells you in Hebrews chapter 12, if he never takes you to the woodshed, you're not really his child anyway. If you're saved, God's going to deal with you as unto father unto children. And uh, listen, on the basis of the price that God paid for our redemption, why wouldn't he get upset if we ignore that and live like a bunch of hellion children? Amen. What did he pay? He, he, compares, uh, he compares it in Isaiah 53 to a burnt offering. His soul was made an offering for sin. You go back and read Leviticus chapter 1 where he talks about that burnt offering. Hideous, hideous thing. Uh, the way they did those, uh, those sacrifices, those animals and all this stuff. And, and cut their throat and shed their blood. And put them on the fire, burn them to ashes, all that kind of stuff. And he says that's a picture of what Jesus, what God paid to redeem us. No wonder Jesus said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me on the cross? Because God the Father was sacrificing his only begotten son, and begotten has to be in there. The new versions leave it out because he's not his only son. I'm a son of God. You're a son of God. His only begotten son uh, was sacrificed for us. And when he paid that kind of price, are we going to just put it aside? Are we going to think this is some kind of joke with God? No, you better fear God. You better fear Him. I'm telling you, it costs you if you don't. You'll get into things you never would have gotten into if you'd feared the Lord. Amen. We've seen people leave this leave this church and get into all kinds of stuff. I've seen them leave here and get, in, get uh, addicted to gambling and go over to Biloxi every weekend instead of coming to church and things like that. And I've seen them get into alcohol when they left Left the church, got away from God, all that kind of stuff, get back in the dope and those kind of things. What's the deal there? They ignored what Jesus paid for their soul. That's what. And he's not pleased with that. 
frivolous toward the death of the Lord Jesus. God is serious. He will, could I just say, wail the daylights out of you if you don't stay right with Him. That's His child. Amen. It'll cost you more. As the old saying goes, it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Amen. And it will. So God is going to protect His interests. His children are His interests. He's going to protect them from the onslaught of the devil and the world of the flesh and all that kind of stuff. And he's going to do it at, at all costs because of what it cost him to buy us in the first place. Amen. Look what he paid for us. 1 Corinthians 6 20 says, You bought with a price. What was it? it? Tells you right there the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We are bought and paid for by the blood of God. Acts 20 verse 28 says, God purchased the church. With his own blood. It was the blood of, of God himself flowing out of the body of Jesus Christ. The Adamic nature, by the way, comes through daddy. Not through mama. So Jesus being, that doesn't mean mama doesn't have an Adamic nature. She got it from her daddy just like you did. But that means uh, Jesus, born of a virgin, had no Adamic nature to pass on to him because his father was God who has no Adamic nature. And that's why he was sinless and never could have sinned in spite of what some people think or believe. Never could have sinned. So God, the Father, took the precious Son of God who never has sinned, never will sin, never can sin and made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us. What a price He paid. You wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't sacrifice my child for some drunk laying in the gutter. God did. God did. And with that price, he's not going to, what he paid for us, he's not going to let us get away with anything. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro on the whole earth, beholding the good and the evil. You're not going to get away with it. I don't care what it was. A little white lie, you ain't going to get away with it. Stole a quarter, you're not going to get away with it. God's going to make you pay that some way or other. Or you're not his child. Real simple. I mean, I'm telling you, he's not going to let us get away with anything. I remember my son telling my daughter when they were kids, and something, something they were wanting to do or whatever. He told her, he said, "Don't you, don't you know, Daddy knows everything we do." <laughs> well, Daddy didn't, but Dad's like to make their kids think they do anyway. Amen. God knows everything we do before we do it. And by the way, you think about something long enough, you will do it. You harbor that in your mind and heart long enough, you'll do it. You get out of the will of God, it's going to cost you more than you want to pay. Amen. God's not going to allow anything to mar the transaction He paid in purchasing us, our souls. Amen. Ephesians 1.14 tells you about that. He's not going to let, it, let, let you ruin His possession that He purchased with His own blood. Say, so, well, what if I decide to do my own thing? What's he going to do about it? Oh, I'd be real careful saying things like that. He might do things you don't want him to do. He's certainly able to do. Well, I sinned. I sinned pretty bad one time, I'll say, but, you know, nothing's ever happened. It's going to. It's going to. Jesus tells you in Matthew, God doesn't get in a hurry. Talks about the, those wheels of judgment grinding. He doesn't get in a hurry. He's not on our calendar. You might not pay for it to the judgment seat of Christ, but you don't pay for it sooner or later. And be better if you pay for it here than at the judgment seat. You lose a bunch of rewards and so forth. Amen. He's going to protect his interest no matter what is involved to do so. And he's going to put you through the ringer if necessary to do so. 1 Corinthians 3.17 says, Defile not the temple of God. Uh, him that defileth the temple of God, that's your body. Him that defileth the temple of God, him from God and Destroy? Destroy? That's what's said. What is that? That's 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, where Paul tells the church at Corinth, they got a church member there living in immorality. He said, deliver him to the devil. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people in hospitals. There's a lot of people in mental institutions because of God's judgment on them. Now, I did not say everybody's sick is under the judgment of God. Y'all understand that? But a lot of people are. People are because they wouldn't follow God. They wouldn't do things God's way. They wouldn't do what God said. And there's children. I'm 
telling you, there's a lot of saved people sleeping under bridges. Anybody that works with derelicts and dope heads and all that kind of stuff, they'll tell you that. They'll tell you that. But Mark back there preached in a youth uh, center for years, I'll guarantee you. Wasn't it, wasn't it some preacher's kids back there in that place? Amen. You don't get away with it. God will deal with you in his own time and in his own way. Chasing can be really serious. Hebrews 10 verse 31 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He's talking about saved people being chastened. In chapter 12 of Hebrews verse 29, our God is a consuming fire. Well, don't let him burn you up. He don't put you in hell, you say, but you could, you could feel like you're there sometimes with some of the chasing that, could, that he could do. So he said in Hebrews 4, 1, let us therefore fear. Fear the Lord. Revelation 14, 7. Fear God and give glory to Him. It's all about Him. Amen. Uh, Proverbs uh, 9, verse 10. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. You got the wisdom at all? You'll have more if you just fear God. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. He said, this is the whole duty of man. That you fear God and keep His commandments. That's it. That's your whole duty. Fear God. Keep His commandments. So that's our motive for living a sober-minded and holy life, he's already told us around this chapter, that God wants us to. Now, let me get number four here. And here he speaks of the mainstay of the Christian. Look at verse 22. The mainstay of the Christian. Verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another uh, with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. It means it doesn't last long. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The main state. What's he talking about here? Love is commanded because of our regeneration, our salvation. Being born again, he says there. He says because we're born again, we're born again of incorruptible seed by the word of God. And because of that, because of our salvation, because of our special relationship, it puts us in with other people who are saved. We're to love the brethren. We're to love one another with a fervent heart, a pure heart, a holy heart, because we're born again. So love for other Christians and among Christians is the mainstay of this Christian life, according to what Peter tells us here, is the chief support of your Christian life. Staying right with God is being in fellowship and unity with other <coughs> Christians. We're to what? Edify one another. We're to provoke one another to love and good works. Amen. You don't have that provocation if you're not in fellowship with Christians, if you're not faithful to church and those kind of things. And what will happen? You'll quit serving the Lord somewhere along the way. You'll lose your faith. Isn't that what happened to John the Baptist? John the Baptist, man, he believed in Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God which taken away the sin of the world, John 129, he said to his, his own disciples. He's the one, he said, I'm not worthy to un unlatch his, undo his shoe latchet. He said, uh, if Jesus came to him, come out of me, I should come to you. You want to be baptized, I should be baptized in you. Had a wonderful high uh, attitude toward Jesus. But then he got arrested for a street preacher and he got put in jail. Sat there a while and started losing his faith. And he sent one of his disciples to his disciples and said, You go ask that man that I've been talking about. Art thou he? Or look we for another. Are you the Messiah? I thought you were, are you? What happened? He got out of the place of fellowship with other Christians, no provocation of love and good works anymore. Uh, no, nobody uh, uh, prompted him to stay right with the Lord and so on like that and lost his faith and began to doubt if Jesus was even who he said he was. I've seen Christians go through that. Get out of church, out of fellowship, not faithful to the house of God. First thing you know, they've lost their faith. They're not trusting the Lord anymore. And I've actually seen them, and I don't doubt they were saved. I've actually seen them get to the point not even believing if God is real. We need each other. We desperately, for the sake of our Christianity, need each other. Especially you guys that work out there in the world, out in that hell hole all week long. Uh, before I got into full-time Christian service, I couldn't wait for Wednesday night to get here and get to church with some people of like faith. And Sunday, 
I don't understand Christians who skip church. I don't understand it at all, especially if they work out in that world. You all want to get away from all that stuff and get where some people believe like you do. It encourages us to keep on in the race and keep on keeping on for the glory. I'll tell you what, everybody here knows where everybody sits. If someone's not here, you know who it is. If they don't have a valid reason, it's a bad testimony. And I've seen this happen. One starts giving church, pretty soon somebody else starts giving. So what are we supposed to be here? Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any time we have special meetings. That's when. That's what the Lord said. So much the more as you see the day approaching. Don't we have a church? I'm telling you, we're talking about God chasing us. He's not joking about this stuff. He will get you to your face, he says in Deuteronomy 7, verse 10. Amen. Get in your face about it. The least you can do as a Christian is be faithful to church. That's the very least. That's the beginning. That's the starting point. Then you build from there. If you're not faithful to church, you're not faithful to God. It's just that simple. You're not faithful to God if you're not faithful to the house of God. So, well, I come most of the time. You ain't faithful. You're supposed to come all the time. Unless you have a valid reason that Jesus will accept at the judgment seat of Christ. And you're not going to accept you laying out of church just because you've got an old grown toenail. It ain't going to happen. Valid reason. So what's a valid reason? You're contagious with some disease. I mean, you might be contagious with happiness, but <laughs> some kind of disease. You don't want to come to church, give somebody else. We understand that. God understands that. But how often is that the case? Uh, I'm not saying you're going to do this. I've sat in church with 102 temperature. I wasn't contagious, but man, split and hit. Why were you there? That's where it's supposed to be. I could sit on the pew as easy as I could sit on the couch in the living room. But I'm not feeling good. Split and headache. Oh, good night. You, well, you couldn't count the number of headaches that I have. My wife will tell you. That ain't going to keep me out of church. I've got to be bedridden to stay out. Say, so, yeah, but you're the preacher. That's the way it was when I wasn't, wasn't a preacher. Bed -bed. Or puking my guts out, we don't want you throwing up on the pew, okay? We don't want you doing that. Amen. You understand that? I'm telling you, people stay out of church for the most frivolous, stupid stuff you ever heard of, and God is not pleased with that at all. He is deadly serious. I think he said his son died for the church. And so sometimes we Christians don't even want to live for it. Verse 21 in our text, he said our faith and our hope should be in God. We're told in Galatians 5 verse 6 that, the faith, that this faith worketh by love. I'm talking about this thing of uh, the mainstay is love of the brethren. Want to be around them all the time. Amen. Uh, it works by love. It, Jesus said, he reduced all the, somebody said, I don't know, I'm going to try to find out, 633 commands in the Bible. I don't know about all that. I know, I know God started out with 10, and Jesus reduced them down to 2. The 10 commandments are found in the 2 commandments Jesus gave in Matthew 25. He said, first of all, you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And secondly, he says, like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's the mainstay of our Christianity is that love and compassion for one another. But what did, what did Paul say? If one member suffer, you're supposed to laugh about it? I didn't have it coming. No, you're supposed to suffer with them. Right. If one who rejoices, you're to rejoice with him, not have an attitude about it. Galatians 16, he says, he says, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Do good to your fellow Christians. You realize when he gives the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, what's the first one? Y'all don't even know, do you? It's love. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is manifest love. That's where it starts. Charity, the greatest, and now by the faith, hope, charity, the greatest thing is charity. Charity never faileth. Charity covereth the multitude of sins. Charity covereth the multitude of faults. Amen. Colossians 3.14, above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. Mm. 
How perfect are we? Charity is the bond of perfection. Listen, if we don't have that continual uh, encouragement from fellow Christians, you don't get it out there in the world. If you don't have it uh, on a regular basis, you will quit reading your Bible, you will quit praying, you will quit going to church. That's all there is to it. We need that. Amen. Be accountable to each other. Jesus said in John 15 verse 12, He said, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Well, how does He love us? He loves us in spite of our faults. In spite of our shortcomings. In spite of our imperfections. And we should love each other the same way. Amen. We all love each other the way Jesus, He said, as I have loved you. Uh, uh, so Peter says Christians are to sum up here. They're to live soberly in this present world. Titus 2 verse 12. That's the mind of the Christian. We're to live a holy life. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 7. For God hath called us unto holiness. That's the morality of the Christian. We're to fear God. 1 Peter 2 17. That's the motive of the Christian. And we're to let, uh, uh, let us love one another. 1 John 4 verse 7. That's the mainstay of the Christian. Now question. If you're a Christian, are those four things evident in your life? Are they? Is any of them missing? Are you doing all those things? If they're not evident, they should be. Sober living, holy living, fearing God, and loving our fellow Christians. Could I say your fellow Christians are not always going to measure up to what you want them to? They're not always going to do things the way you want them to? But you're not the Holy Spirit. That's his problem, his business. You're to love him anyway. Amen. Amen. So, why don't you analyze yourself? Amen. Never mind the person next to you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Are you living a sober Christian life? Are you living a holy Christian life? Are you fearing God like you ought to? Are you loving your fellow Christians? Think about this. Think about the people in this church. Never mind people everywhere else. Think about the people in this church. Is there one person that you would maybe not verbalize it, but you would have to say to yourself, I don't really love that person. You're not a good Christian then. You're just not a good Christian at all. And the Lord knows it. Now the altar's open. There's no music playing, but you know where it's at. And if those four things are not evident in your Christian mind, I think I'd, I think I'd head for the altar myself. If I'm not living the holy life God wants me to, if I'm not loving the brethren like God wants me to, I think I go do business with the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Lord, you know I got all against this brother or sister in Christ. You know uh, I, I don't really love them like you want me to do. Lord, you know they crossed my brain. I haven't loved them since. Well, you better thank God he didn't quit loving you when he crossed his brain because you've done it. And so have I. Amen. So was at the altar, we'll wait. If you need to come, come on. It's not a game with the Lord. Like it is with some of you. The Lord's very serious.